This video is brought to you by Midway USA. Support the channel by choosing Midway for your shooting and outdoor supplies. So if that's the case, then why, instead of an M16 that was adopted by the US military in the 1960s, is Hannah using a weird, shitty budget version of the M16 that was adopted by the armed forces of Tonga? That makes zero sense. I don't even know what continent Tonga's on. I don't recall. Oh, stay down. We want to hurt no one. We're here for the bank's money, not your money. Yeah, you Benny called in about a bank they're looking at or something. Vincent! Far East National Bank 1130! Who the hell are you? The real question is, what is such a boss man using? Such a noob shotgun. My friend, you need a boss gun. I need a friend. What do you say? Only the best for my friends like you. A few moments later. Carbine, the effing rifle. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. We go. Let's uh. start at 150. The steel army awaits. Impact. Dead center. Okay. 200. Ready. Yes, sir. Dead center. Nice. The FNC is essentially an AK masquerading as a NATO rifle. So maybe I should do belly hold. All right, let's try a belly hold here. Okay, two inches low of dead center. Nice. Okay. All right, I'm there at three. Let's try a dead hold and see how we do. Be on bird. Just off the left. Actually, maybe it was an impact on the first shot. Okay. The second I aimed off to the right. Impact for sure on that. That was on the very low corner of the plate though. Okay, should I go again? Yeah, why not? We'll just, uh, let's just count that as number one shot on this and then give us one more. Yeah, dead center. Okay. 
You probably put four on that target. <laughs> okay. Bad. Henry, the deer are multiplying. Oh no. There's two there now. 300? Uh, 350. Oh, 350, yes. Off the left by about six, maybe eight inches. I mean, I was checking the wind flag. I didn't expect you to send it oh, so quick. Okay. We're not we're not really in sync right now, are we? No. Impact. Off the right. Impact. All right. So now I'm going to switch to the 400 meter site. We'll see how it does. Okay, I'm there. 400. Dead on. Left. No, if anything, it was just a touch low. Okay. Impact. Could have been a hit too, to be honest. The plate was still moving from the previous shot. I see. It was either an impact or it was a touch low. I see. Okay, 450. I'm pretty sure that was an impact. That was for sure. Yeah. Okay. This plate's just not moving at all. Well, let's see how you finish out at five. Okay, oh, you're 500. shooting 55 grains, huh? Yep. I can tell, right? It's just they're just not impacting a huge, uh, huge amount on the target. Yeah. Right? I heard something. Yep. That was an impact. Yep. Nice. Wow, two for two at five, huh? Yeah. Not bad, not bad, FN. Let's see. One, two. Ah, yeah, yeah, definitely low 20s, man. Nice. So, <clears throat> two position sights. Uh, stepping into it there is already going to be some trouble running two position sites because you've only got two points of reference for it. Uh, but I mean, pretty adequate, pretty adequate for, for what the performance was, even though there were only two positions to aim at. Um, I'd say it was one of the rifles that is very similar to a Kalashnikov. The other one that's usually compared to this would be the uh, SG550, the, the SIG which has a, a multi-position uh, multi sight more than this. I think the rifle was designed sort of with a vein of the M16A1 era uh, using a two-position combat sight, 5.56, high velocity, low mass uh, cartridge. It most certainly was designed as a response to what the, uh, what the AR-15 was and trying to hit that market for the European sector. Um, the Belgians used it for a while. The Swedes used it for a while. I mean, this is honestly my first time taking it out past 100. Um, it, it recoils, the recoil feels like just a light, it feels like you're shooting a lighter recoiling uh, foul. But the accuracy compared to a foul, I would say is an improvement. Uh, the foul, even with the multi, um, the multi range graduated sights, seem to hit worse than this particular rifle. Um, and again, you know, the entire recoiling, the entire system inside, the three lug rotating bolt is a, in my opinion, a step up from the foul's tilt bolt design. But what do you think, Josh? I think it's probably best we take it over to the debrief and uh, look at some scenes from heat. Ah, yes. We'll see you guys at the debrief. Hello there. I'm just here maintaining the nine hole scar so that it's always ready when I need it. But did you know that the first few times we actually took the scar out to pattern it for accuracy, we actually had a very tough time getting any sort of decent results. And it wasn't until we determined that some of these screws here that hold the barrel in place had actually worked themselves loose. But how did we get to that point? Shooting 
hundreds of rounds of match grade 308 ammunition and working through the problem solving required to get the scar functioning correctly. Well, it's due in no small part to the small but loyal community that we have over on Patreon, who support us with the financials in order to be able to go out and buy ammunition to perform these tests, as well as the emotional and intellectual support that, well, let's be honest, you all know we very much need. So we'd certainly like to have you guys consider joining us over on Patreon. And of course, if that's not something you're interested in, we'd very much like to also just simply hear from you in the comments down below here as well. Hope you guys enjoy the rest of the episode. Onward we go. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the show. This right here is uh, the Indonesian SS01 Pindad. Nope, Henry, no. no. This is the FNC. It's the FNC. I know. They wish it were the SS1 pin dad, which ever since this channel started, one of it, it's like one of the strangest requests has been for us to review an Indonesian SS1 pin dad, which is a licensed copy of the FNC, which this is the Belgique FNC. It is the genuine FNC, um, followed by the Indian Insas. Uh, so very very sorry this is not an ss01 pin dad i highly doubt we'll get an ss1 pin dad but for those who are looking for an fnc and an honest take on fnc we've had what like six months at this point to play with this rifle yeah i'd say so um both on the long range and then we did uh, all of our like close and mid-range handling stuff yeah yeah so i, I mean within within reason because this is a collector's piece we didn't we didn't slam the rifle to the ground per se we did not mud test it unless josh did without my knowledge uh which you know thanks john for loaning us this rifle but anyways i digress the fnc oh man like josh this is one of those 80s and 90s movie guns that everybody wants to get their hands on and I feel like a lot of people have an idea of sort of what it is, but they haven't delved in farther underneath that movie level of the FNC. Yeah, I mean, I, I know I know it from Heat. Like, mm -hmm. that's why I know this gun. Uh, it's not from anything other than that. So with that said, Henry, why don't we... Why don't we get into some of the history around the design? Obviously, you mentioned that this was basically a Kalashnikov, which I'm sure everybody uh, who is <laughs> uh, like, you know, on the hyper specific level is going to have loved that you said. So why don't you uh, defend that position and talk us through the history? Yeah. OK, so the FNC, um, formerly the predecessor to this was the FN Cal. So the FN Cal was actually a more complicated design than this. Uh, short stroke gas piston system. Uh, it was developed in order to, how can I put this? SIG does this a lot now in, in the US. When manufacturers somehow realize that a country is looking for an alternative rifle, uh -huh. and they start developing things uh, to meet that demand before the demand comes to the market. And so you had the the swiss who were who had developed the sg550 series from the 540 series which there's a different story to that with the italians but on the belgian side they were developing something also to or answer to a french demand for a 556 service rifle because of course they were using the mas 4956 up until this point and they were looking at uh something that was a little bit more modern than a woodstock 10 round intermediate cartridge or you know full rifle cartridge feeding uh, semi-auto rifle and this is what the belgians ended up coming out with after the fn cal and the interesting thing we're talking about the this being an ak it's not just the belgians if you look across the field so of course you have the um the germans with the 33 and the 556 um, and that actually came 
it's actually older than most people think. It, it, it came around the same time the M16 was around, as soon as they got the cartridge. They decided to tinker with the roller delayed blowback system. But outside of the Germans, uh, we also had the Swiss with the SG540, SG541, and the Fame series of rifles that turned into the SG550 and 551 that you and I both really enjoy shooting. We also have the Italian AR7090, uh, which is also an equally drippy system like this. But one of the similarities that all three of those rifles have, the SIG, the Beretta AR7090, and the FNC, is that it is a long stroke gas piston, two lug rotating bolt system, very similar to the Kalashnikov. Uh, of course, you have both the Beretta and the Swiss variants with the recoil spring and the uh, where the piston is, uh, but the FNC, even closer to the AK, has the piston in the, uh, ha sorry, the recoil spring in the back uh, and sleeves into the bulk carrier group, much like an AK. And so if people were to say that 5.56 AKs don't work, uh, <laughs> literally. Oh, shots fired. Shots fired, Henry. <laughs> But regardless, I mean, the, the system itself is a, I mean, it's a proven system. Yeah. It's a highly reliable system. We saw today that accuracy wise, it actually performs yep. extremely well. An and for anyone yep. further shots nice. fired to the Aiken wow. community, um, if anyone were to say, oh, well, the long stroke gas piston system just can't hold accuracy. We have this, we have the SG550 and the SG551 that we've shot on the course and the SG556, the American copy of the Swiss rifle, all of them shoot lights out and they all are AK inspired system shooting the 556 cartridge. Like that, this, it's interesting to look back and see how this turned into the conventional operating system to a lot of those big brand European manufacturers uh, out there when they were running a gas piston system and not the short stroke. Hmm. So Henry, one of the things I want to draw sort of your commentary towards here that you haven't mentioned just yet is the sighting system. The reason being, in our past experience, generally a two position sight results in subpar performance on the course because you're having to adjust your methodology for shooting basically on every target, going from sort of a six o'clock hold to a center hold to a 12 o'clock hold, then back to a six o'clock hold, center hold, 12 o'clock hold, and doing those things um, generally are, makes, makes running the course challenging and difficult, especially when you hit that 12 o'clock hold on the second site position and you got nowhere else to go. Mm -hmm. So were you surprised with the performance based on the sighting system here? And how were you able to utilize it? To, I mean, you, you punched 500 two for two. I mean, how are you able to utilize this sighting system see, differently than you have two position sighting systems in the past, if at all? So um, my shooting discipline comes uh, back to a lot of service rifle stuff. And the service rifle that I was most familiar with was the A2, uh, the M16A2, the AR15A2, with the uh, gradual sights that hits every single uh, distance as you go out. And so in the past, that's what I've been most comfortable with. But um, as I've started to shoot more and more, uh, I think I've gone out of that shell a little more, especially this year, There's there's a few that our two position sites that we've seen actually perform fairly well. Uh, obviously, you saw this this guy, the FNC, the AR-180. I don't know when that video is going to come out, but the AR-180 really surprised me because it was super janky. Uh, the K1A1, for what the rifle was, the Korean uh, roof, the roof Korean rifle, actually performed decently well with a two position sight, and so. Uh, I'm seeing that rifles that actually do hold a core accuracy, it matters less as long as you can, like in your mind, you can figure that out. As in a sense that your short range sight, your, your default sight, the 300 meter or 250 meter sight, that's there for a reason for 5.56 rifles because that is a very good battle zero 
to draw on a torso size target and hit above and below sort of you know on that torso target now our plates are smaller so we have to be a little bit more mindful than just a torso target i know it's it's confusing because a lot of guys out there you look at them you ex expect oh those are ipsic targets they're not they're like what are like half size or or like c zone? It's a c zone it's like yeah. two thirds yeah basically yeah. so so the the whole shell is is carved out of the ipsic target essentially and so i do have to be more mindful of where i'm holding it so at 300 350 or 350 per se i'm really holding at the very top with the side post covering the target but then once i progress to 400 and 450 i just flip it to the next one and i start from the base again of the target and just let it land high let it land on on target at 450 and then once again hold it high so it lands below at 500 and so as as more as i've shot i've kind of learned to use that as my system pushing out now that's actually a fairly effective combat system if all you're dealing with are iron sights and and i want to draw this conversation back to this though this was this the fnc was a 1980s rifle it was through and through 1980s the sg 550 series was also developed during that time frame so you have the, all these like long 556 rifles uh because they were competing with the m16a1 and so i know okay so josh earlier when we took it out to the short range said like every mean thing he could about the fnc like he, he seemed to really dislike the fnc when we were shooting who it. me <laughs> yes <No>. you <laughs> and this particular rifle is crap the fnc though like if you were looking at, at who was competing with competing with the m16a1 your length really doesn't matter you know because you're t talking about a one meter long rifle anyways um your sights i mean it's a two position sight you're really suffering on the weight um but you could also market it as you know increased reliability because there is all the lore surrounding how the m16 was unreliable back then i saw the commercial reasoning behind developing something like the fnc um, and commercially they did end up with a few nations that adopted it as uh, for a domestic license manufacturer like Indonesia, as we talked about, the SS1, Pindad. Uh, you've got the uh, Swedes who developed the AK5s. Uh, and subsequently, the AK5C, like all the way pushing forward, you know, the, the latest iteration of it. Uh, but then I think one of the big reasons, and this is my personal opinion, this is commentary. Uh, I think one of the biggest strengths that the M16 ended up building into were twofold. The M16 was, you know, as a core rifle is extremely light, uh, but also it could be scaled down very easily. So turning the M16 into the M4 length, and then in some cases even shorter with the, the Colt Commandos, a lot of times people just look at these things and they say, oh, the barrel length is, is whatever, you know, it's comparable to the M16 or not. You can cut the barrel length short, but they don't, they forget to talk about the receiver length. So the receiver lengths, and then a lot of times, you know, stock lengths on these things uh, may or may not be able to be adjustable. And so even though the M16 was unable to fold like the FNC, this is a fixed stock. The other version is the fold stock version. You, a lot of times you would see that if you, do, if you took a 14 inch XM4 or 727, uh, you know, the, the shorter Colt carbines, and you compare it to them, they are lighter, and overall length, they are shorter. Because this is still kind of the length of a foul, because it was here to compete with that M16A1 uh, main infantry battle rifle concept. At the end of the day, if the company was unable to shorten it and modernize it to take modern equipment, as we saw, like we were going into the GWAT era, the early 2000s, the development of Picatinny rails, development of better optics, about development of lights and lasers. You didn't see yeah. these things to be nearly as um, desirable to for militaries to adopt at that point. But right. you know, a lot of people, a lot of people will say, "Oh, it's not modular. It, it wasn't designed to be like that." But then the M16 kind of just fell into a really 
really good aftermarket situation to support a lot of the development of it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, Henry, to your point about, you know, I made, uh, I, I wasn't a fan shooting this. I think that that's because, you know, this item nowadays is more so in line with the collector's item uh, than it is with like an actual performance based firearm. Uh, or at least within the concepts of modern standards, as you've just described. Where that sort of boils down to, though, is that, you know, I'd say I had probably an inflated idea of what this rifle was going to be or what it was going to be capable of, A, from you know, sort of the limited pop culture exposure that there is of it uh, in American cinema, that it was sort of like the main good good guy, bad guy rifle in probably one of the best shootouts ever filmed in a movie. Uh, and then at the same time, you know, the excitement we had when, when you called me up, you're like, dude, we're getting an FNC. Like, it's going to be awesome. Um, you know, I had a pretty high threshold in my mind of like how awesome it was going to be. And then we get out in the range with it and it basically feels like it's a little bit clunky. Uh, the grip angle absolutely sucks. Um, just like all fouls, uh, just absolutely sucks. Um, and then in spite of the fact that, you know, we're describing it as sort of a 223-556 AK in terms of its internals, like it doesn't feel like a 5.56 AK when you're shooting it. 5.56 AKs, in my opinion, are exceptionally smooth shooting, um, very enjoyable to shoot. And this was not really that. It was just, again, a sort of clunky, looser tolerance as everything felt like it was sort of like banging around. It wasn't particularly exciting to shoot. Um, and then even things like uh, the mag, the magwell. Right, it's just like a big square block, um, you know, no flare, no nothing. You just jam that sun going in there. Um, but yeah, there, it misses some of the niceties that are probably available on like just average rifles that we think of nowadays. And yeah, I mean that that's what it really boiled down to. I think in terms of where I picked up the rifle and felt it went, huh? Yeah, okay. Yeah, this really just does feel like another like 80s sort of like, carbine it, it's expectation management right mm. um so you know you expected something spectacular it was the boss gun in heat it was the big boss's rifle i mean first of all how did he get that you know obviously we found out in the very beginning <laughs> footage but um how how did how did he come about with an fnc you know like at first i was i when i was young i was thinking oh then they must issue those in police departments in america because i was overseas when i saw that in the first but um and i didn't know what it was but i think I, you bring up a good point though i think in especially with collectible firearms rare and collectible firearms uh we run into this dynamic shall I say, um, you're looking at rifles that are rare and collectible being expensive. And in our minds, we equate rare and expensive with it must be really good. But sometimes, yeah. honestly, like this thing was not designed to outpace like a scar. Like FN designed the scar for a reason. They didn't take this and modernize it. Uh, this was designed as an infantry rifle. It was designed for the lowest common denominator. It was designed to work in bad conditions. It was designed to have sights and an accuracy that could reach a certain distance and, and be combat effective, which we saw today in a European open field type of engagement. It could very well be combat effective for that type of stuff. It was designed in the 80s before there was any modernization. And it was adopted by countries um, that, I'm not saying they don't do modernization, but Indonesia, I am not tracking that they have any modernization kits. I think the most modernized FNC is probably going to be your um, AK-5s in Sweden, which they did alter the, the front handguard to take rails and stuff. Um, I think... At the end of the day, this rifle is exactly that. It's a rare collectible rifle from that era. And and in order to in order to appreciate it, I think you have to have that pre-programmed in your mind, but a lot of Americans just watch 
heat and they think it's the boss gun and it's expensive and it's rare so it must be really good now i mean i will say though like if we were to compare this to the sig the 550s and 551s especially the 551 for me i mean i'm a fanboy um with the, the sig 551s I think there are certain attributes that the 551 really did better than this. You know, not having to, uh, first of all, like the French actually still use the 55 series in a lot of their maritime service uh, fields because they actually work very, very well in, in salt water and, and a lot of the uh, wet environments. But back to this though. It is a rifle that was designed for the infantryman, designed to compete with the M16A1, not designed to compete with the M4 Block II. Because we have another FN yeah. rifle was designed to compete with the M4 Block II. And it failed. <laughs> it's, it's, also, it's also really, really sad of the story because it's actually... Oh, FN, brother, what... <laughs> It's one of those things, right? They design a rifle and then it's a follow-on to the FN SCAR that, you know, it did not do that well. But again, sorry, sorry, sorry. There's a lot of stuff that, that's bringing us back away from the FNC. On the FNC, though, I mean, it's a solidly reliable infantry rifle that could do decently well in a 1980s European open battlefield concept sense. But... It just did not have the same market to modernize it. It did not have the same adoption to customize it and, and push it to the next, usher it into the next era. Yeah. And that's where it stuck. And there you have it. So without further ado, those of you who are still here at the end of this session, you're the true fans. We love you. Thank you for your support. Make sure you do all that good YouTube stuff. Like, comment, subscribe, follow us on the podcast channel and over on Patreon if you are so inclined. And until next time, wait, we'll see you on the range. Wait. We haven't thanked John yet. You thanked John in the intro of this video, Henry. However, I will allow you to continue your thanks. Thanks. So... I have to thank our friend John for loaning us the heat boss gun rifle, as we shall know it from now on. Uh, I don't know. It may or may not go home. What do you say, Josh? Yeah, your precious armor. <laughs> Gratefully accepted. <laughs> no, of course it will go home, uh, but very reluctantly. But still, I wanted to say thanks to John and uh, honestly to people who just... It's crazy, Josh. I mean, people who just loan us stuff to look at and... It still blows my mind uh, that we get to do this and we have a community that's supportive like this. So, yeah, huge thanks to everybody who uh, helped thanks us. Thanks to you guys. Red con one, green to green, top copy over. Red con 96, this is.